There are only two animals that have traveled the full scope of the planet. The first is the Arctic tern. This tiny bird, no heavier than a chicken cutlet, is in endless pursuit of summer. The Arctic tern zigzags its way from the Antarctic to Antarctica, chasing the sun and hitting dozens of countries along the way. The Arctic tern can travel up to 56,000 miles during their six-month migration season. That's more than the Earth's circumference itself. I'm sure they carboload on plenty of fruits and spiders ahead of time. All year round, this flighty little fowl loops around the planet in a graceful figure eight, tracing the coastlines of North and South America, or Europe and Africa, taking in the vastness of this elegant blue marble we all call home. The Arctic tern sees more of the planet than pretty much all other species combined, except for one, humans. But we cheated a bit. For thousands of years, we have plodded along at our own speed, gradually populating every continent and large island. Most of us traveled at a foot's pace. Some lucked out with horses. And even when we fashioned wood into boats, we never traveled more than a hundred miles a day at most. And it was often facing an uncertain death. We have always looked up at the birds flying over our heads, wondering what can they see that we can't. Our need to know what else is out there is in our DNA. And after 200,000 years of strolling along, all of that was about to change. Once we harnessed the power of water and turned it into steam, we began to push and pull our way into the future. In our eyes, the Industrial Revolution made the Earth spin a little faster. And in 1889, two women were off to put that speed to the test. I'm Adrian Bain, and this is Strangers Abroad, a race around the world, based on the true story of Elizabeth Bisland. On November 14th, both women's backs are to New York. As they move further away from the city, I imagine two little blue dots, like the ones on Google Maps, but being pulled in opposite directions around the globe. And the world will unfold itself differently for both women as Nellie's blue dot sails over the Atlantic and Liz traverses across America. Their first day of travel has begun. Let the journey begin. Day one, November 14th. Liz's train pulls out of Grand Central. And what Liz is feeling isn't a tingle of excitement about this adventure. Instead, it feels like lightning is shooting through her veins. She's just trying to stomach what just happened. She looks out the window. The winter sky takes the sun away early. The shortest day of the year is approaching. But where will she be by then? Liz takes a breath and quiets her thoughts. She tries to sit in the calmness of the train carriage. 
there's a particular quiet that happens when your train leaves the station. The chaos and the rush is over. The anxiety of missing your ride settles. The bittersweet goodbyes and the see you soons are done. Your shoulders drop. All the physical and emotional baggage you slept on with you. As the train plunges into the woods of Westchester, she glides along the Hudson. The Catskills pass her by. It looks so quiet outside. A calmness stretches over her as she enters the dark countryside. The window morphs into a mirror. She puts her hand on it and looks at the hopelessness in her own eyes. Elizabeth really sees herself, not as some globe-trotting writer, but as a woman coerced into doing a man's bidding for his profit at the expense of her safety and social life. I have worked too hard to suddenly lose the reins on my life. This is so foolish. I just want to be back home. Because once she stops feeling frustrated, fear takes over. She is living at a time when almost all women on the planet are second-class citizens, and diseases don't have cures. And she's expected to go around the world? Is it safe out there? What if I get sick? What if someone robs me or takes advantage of... No, 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 that can't. That won't happen. But who will look out for me? How on earth will I get all of these connections? Tears well in her eyes. The feeling of anticipation of what is to come is pressing on Liz's diaphragm, making it harder to breathe. Can I really do this? The world is full of booby traps. As she rides the fast Western Express train to Chicago, Liz hopes the train is true to its name and she should be in Chicago's Union Depot by the next night. From Chicago, she will quickly catch a train bound to Omaha and venture through the middle of the country until she reaches the other edge of America. Liz is heading west manifesting a destiny she doesn't really want to embrace. To be fair, her ride is pretty smooth. The train is designed by Louis Tiffany, the man behind those iconic periwinkle boxes. Each of the train cars has a different international theme. There is the English Baroque room, an Italian Renaissance lounge, a Spanish mission room, the Chinese dynasty parlor, and the ancient Egyptian library. It's hard for Liz to clock that she will actually get to go to almost all of these countries. And she does have her own sleeping compartment and a modern women's washroom. And there are female maids to assist solo female travelers. Nevertheless, she's alone strikingly independent. Solo female travelers back then are quite uncommon and always a curiosity. So as she sits, frustrated about her fate, Liz just thinks, All right, just take it one day at a time, one stop at a time. Let's just get to California. As she gets ready for bed, she fights to get her clothes off in this tiny sleeper room. Her hands hit the ceiling and her elbows smack against the walls. But once she's finally in her sleepwear, she tucks in for the long night. Two women racing for dear life in opposite direction. Rival lady travelers. Woman against woman. 
As Liz comes down from this wild day, the newspaper editors work hard into the night to publish her departure and anything they can find out about her for tomorrow's morning paper. On the morning of the 15th, newspapers printed that there isn't just one female reporter on this race around the world, but two. Papers like the Herald, the Tribune, and the New York Times print out a few sentences about these two intrepid female journalists, if they printed anything at all. Papers that weren't the New York World or Cosmopolitan stuffed information about Liz and Nellie down at the bottom of their pages, near the sporting sections, printed next to headlines like, Death by Bicycles. And rereading these newspaper clippings now, it's astonishing how no one really cared to get their facts straight. They get both women's ages wrong. Miss Fly is 30. She's 25. And Miss Bisland is 22. She's 28. They misspell Nellie's given name repeatedly. Some places think that Liz is trying to beat Nellie's pre-existing record. And journalists can't stop talking about how beautiful Liz is. Miss Bisland is one of the most beautiful young ladies in all of New York and will provide an excellent representative of American women in every one of the many countries through which she will travel. And how Nellie somehow hates men. A very ordinary, everyday young woman, rather slight in form, leaning to eccentricity in dress, masculine in her tastes and ideas, and a man-hater from way back. One paper speculates that Liz... She will be accompanied with a number of carrier pigeons, which will be freed at regular intervals from the Pacific, and which will bring dispatches with her. Which is just not true. Another paper declares that the two women will meet up in China and... They will have Christmas dinner together in Hong Kong. No matter what, if it's news, it's apparently good enough to print. The news spreads faster than either woman can travel. JBW doesn't really care how accurate any information is about his literary editor. As long as the press is hot, what does it matter what anyone publishes? Wrong press is still press. Pulitzer does not share JBW's enthusiasm. Pulitzer is extremely upset that Walker has forced Miss Bisland to ride on Miss Bly's coattails or the hem of her dress, for that matter. But now that both women are gone, everyone made guesses as to who will win and when. People calculated that Liz is already in the lead, even though Nellie had an eight-and-a-half-hour head start. Reporters guess that Elizabeth will come back sometime on the 23rd or 24th of January, and Nellie is more likely to come in around the 26th or 27th. Some were supportive. Godspeed, cries everyone, to the two brave girls who, having chosen a career which, for many years, was occupied almost exclusively by men, are hurrying alone through foreign lands with a view to a success which will rival that of many men of journalistic fame. Others are weirdly annoyed. They both represent newspapers, and this extensive traveling is for advertising purposes. If they get around in 75 days, other cranks will doubtlessly spring up in an attempt to do the same act in 65 days. This sort of ambition, if such it may be called, is contagious. I don't know why he's so mad. And some missed the point entirely. Name the prettiest girl win. Neither woman will have any idea of what is being said about them. Because for the next seven days, Nellie is gliding along the Atlantic while Liz hopscotches across America. Day 2, November 15th. Liz wakes up 
and stares at the bright winter light illuminating Lake Erie's southern belly. The fast Western Express train cuts through the nose of New York and heads to Ohio. Liz marvels at the naked trees that are slowly replaced by thick pine as they trace along the edge of Pennsylvania. But with no one to talk to and nothing to read, Liz can't stop thinking about her future. Why, who will I talk to for the next two months? Am I just supposed to stare at a window this whole time? It is looked down on for a woman of her status to travel alone and unladylike for any woman to strike up a conversation with a man or accept conversation from one. She's upset that her gender restricts her. And I'm sure that under different circumstances, Liz would have been excited about this once-in-a-lifetime adventure. But while sitting in this quiet train carriage, headed towards Chicago, Liz does not have a why. When you travel, you have to have a reason for going. Without a reason for going, you feel aimless. Nellie has a why. She's trying to go around the world in under 80 days. She has a clear purpose. Liz has no incentive to do this. She seems more like the kind of traveler who wants to explore one place in depth. She wants to sit in Italian coffee shops, sip espresso, and write about the locals going on their day. She wants to walk slowly along the Great Wall of China and examine every stone. Liz likes to simmer. If she's going to travel and write about it, she does not want to be rushed. So on that train, this dream trip is her living nightmare. When the train pulls into Union Station, Elizabeth was promised that an emissary from Cosmopolitan is supposed to come and keep her company as she waits for her train to Omaha. So, as she steps off the platform, weighed down by her bags and her melancholy, she watches all of her fellow passengers embrace their loved ones waiting for them. Couples kiss each other, Parents hug their adult children. Friends squeeze one another and pinch their cheeks. She is surrounded by love and warm welcomes. And as the crowd thins out and everyone goes on with their lives, Elizabeth waits. And then suddenly, she's left standing alone. The quietness makes her a little anxious. She waits a little longer for this emissary. Ugh, Mr. Walker is probably comfortably sleeping in his home, making money off my exploits and discomfort. The least he can do is send someone reliable to keep me company. (sighs) Just add salt to the wound, why don't you? Then she starts to play that mental game when someone is late and we don't want to act on it just yet. Ugh, all right, I'll just wait 10 more minutes and then, well, okay, I'll just, I'll wait five more minutes, just five. Just, where is he? After a while, Liz is fed up. She's been ghosted by a stranger. So she goes out in search of something to eat. I wandered about a vast, gloomy, and rather empty station in the care of a friendly conductor. A conductor offers to sit with her at the train station diner. So she sits on this high countertop, making small talk with the conductor as she eats sad ham and tea. 
everything tastes sad when you're sad. The conductor is sitting with her because, at the time, it's frowned upon for a woman to sit alone in restaurants. Women are discouraged from eating in public because they're assumed to be prostitutes. What could a woman possibly be doing by herself? Back then, women are always encouraged to have a male companion when they eat in finer dining areas. There used to be actual signs that said, quote, lone woman not wanted, end quote, which is a larger metaphor for women at the time. So in the company of this watchful conductor, Liz swallows her last sip of tea and sits on the stool for a moment. Although she is full, she still feels empty in this quiet food court. The conductor, having given me a commiserating adieu, I slip away into the night, very homesick, very cross. Liz cannot see how this journey is going to get any better. She settles up her tab, grabs her bags, and makes her way to the platform on her way to Omaha. Day three, November 16th. Liz wakes up refreshed on this slower train plodding through the center of America. Now in a new time zone, Liz is feeling better. But with that night's sleep, I slipped away my amazement and awoke at daybreak in my right mind. When she pulls back her curtain, she is welcomed by a limitless land of pearl. Watching the rising sun peek out of the darkness, maybe it is the quietness of the morning, the tranquility of the Midwest that shifts her mood. Suddenly, The world is vibrant again. She looks up at the hundreds of billowing shiny white clouds above her. As big as elephants, they dangle above her head but still don't make a dent in the expansive prairie skies. The Great Plains feel boundless. Even the frost on the windows enrapture her as she makes out scenes and faces in the ice. She takes notes as she passes through the fields of cold. But maybe she focuses on the landscape because she can't find anyone to talk to, other than the reporters. Once Elizabeth's undertaking is published, local reporters catch wind and try to find her as she makes her way across America. They want an interview with this mysterious and beautiful female writer attempting such a novel adventure. Say, are you Elizabeth Bisland? I'm Chick Hannaford from the Omaha Daily News Journal. I would love to talk to you about your flying trip around the world. Brock Grizzle of the Chicago Tribune. Miss Bisland, can I get a word? They hop on at a station and ride for one or two stops. How are you to travel for so long without a man? How do you feel about Miss Bly? Then, once they get the information they need, the reporters hop off and take the reverse train back home. So after hours of this cycle, Liz is tired of saying the same thing over and over and over again. She doesn't want to be reminded all the time about this ridiculous stunt she's doing. Nothing has happened yet. But assume that from now on until we get to California, she's accompanied by a reporter. Although Liz is surrounded by people, she still feels lonely. I would rather talk about the most recent Emma Lazarius book. Do I have to repeat myself again and again to reporters? Liz looks around on the quiet train. She sees an old couple nestled together in their seats. She craves that kind of intimacy. Not necessarily romantic, 
Just someone who knows you so well that you don't have to explain yourself to them. So she calls over to them across the aisle and tries to strike up a conversation. But even after decades of being together, outsiders were very much outside. Liz, who has charmed most of the East Coast elite, could not get through to this couple. They turn away every attempt she makes to talk to them. (sighs) So instead, Liz takes solace in nature. Nature can't turn her away. Before she knows it, she's in Omaha. And when Liz gets off the train, she is now over a thousand miles away from everything she knows. Her mood has softened over all of that landscape. And it's here that she decides to embrace her fate. Suddenly, she is interested in actually trying to compete in this race. At the Omaha train station, She goes up to the ticket booth and sweet-talks her way onto a smaller, faster train. But she doesn't get on any old train. She hops on the Union Pacific mail train. Back then, mail trains go express, and they don't have to deal with the endless loading and offloading of passengers. All they need is to get the mail from one side of the country to the other as quickly as possible. And the mail train did offer a few extra seats to regular folks who are in no way affiliated with the United States Postal Service, but need to get somewhere in a hurry. These regular passengers sacrificed comfort for the sake of time. And Liz is about to be one of those people. And coincidentally enough, this mail train that Liz hops on is also in a race against time. The United States government approached the Union Pacific Railroad with a sweet little offer. They wanted to try to shave a few hours off the drive from New York to San Francisco. The government wants to save a full day of delivery so mail from New York can arrive in the California morning instead of at night. So the government offers the Union Pacific Railroad $75,000 to get the job done, which is over $2 million by today's standards. The Union Pacific happily agreed. So... By going on this specific train, Liz should hopefully arrive in San Francisco 10 hours earlier. This is a race within a race. And by switching to this train, Liz starts to take this silly little stunt seriously. When Liz gets on the train, she settles in looks around, and notices she's the only woman on board. There's a certain heat that rises within you when you know that you're the only lady in a room. So she keeps to herself and continues to focus on the landscape. The trees and shrubs grew rarer and more rare and finally vanish altogether. Now, in the center of her country, she sees that not everyone grows up surrounded by Spanish moss or grand mansions. Parts of America's landscape are remote and arid, and the vegetation is sparse. The train passes cabins and reservations where the Native Americans have been relocated. Now, in the Jules Verne's book, Around the World in 80 Days, he depicts very tropey scenes about Native American lives, like images of Native Americans riding on horseback alongside rushing trains, 
or lively scenes of communities dancing around drum circles with big bonfires and teepees poking out of the landscape. But Liz has a first-hand look at their reality. And as she sees it, it's an unhappy land with a rainless sky. She gets a knot in her stomach as she weaves through the lonely plains from the comfort of a modern train. She contemplates the rough life of those who live here. Great, great plains lay all around us, covered certainly with withered, ashen-colored plant, the bitter results of an unequal struggle for existence. Settlements were few and far between. Scrawny horses picked up a scant living and an occasional yellow cur that came out and barked at us as we went by was the only other form of animal life to be seen. From time to time we passed a dwelling, a square cavern of gray, unpainted boards. The only decent proof I ever saw of the human inhabitants of these silent, lonely homes was a tiny pair of butternut trousers fluttering on the clothesline, and I greatly fear that they were perhaps his only pair. Liz scans through the unraveling of the Homestead Act. In 1862, Americans with European descent were given free land across the American West. And the Native Americans and the animals they herd were pushed off the land that they had been cultivating for thousands of years. The Plains Native Americans used to take up most of Nebraska and now were relocated to one small county in the state. During this time, people of European descent saw America as the land of opportunity, where the natives saw this same time period as one of displacement. And I think Liz could really feel the gravity of that situation, that quiet depression that seeps through these grasslands. There was something insidious and brutal about the doom laid upon this unhappy territory. She stares out until darkness descends. Day four, November 17th. When the next morning arrives, in the distance, she can see the tips of the snow-capped Rockies. The leisurely ride that Liz is enjoying is about to be over. Our speed in this part of the country was terrible. The train is behind schedule with two million on the line. And unbeknownst to Liz, arrangements are being made to pick up the pace. That whole day as they plod towards the Rockies, the temperature drops. Liz rubs her hands together and hugs herself closer as the tips of the mountains get larger but fade into darkness. Somewhere that night, between Colorado or Wyoming, an engineer is telegraphed to hop on board at the next stop and take the wheel through the worst part of the Rockies. Day five, November 18th. Around midnight, Liz's train pulls into the station. The car doors open. The slicing Colorado wind seeps in. And a special engineer stomps up 
into the entryway. He shakes the layers of snow off of his feet and mustache and gives a dashing look to his passengers. Cyclone Bill has just entered. Cyclone Bill's real name is Mr. Foley. He's a rowdy, jovial Irishman who's a master mountain engineer and known for his speed. Liz is a little unsettled that he's named after a violent storm. When he enters, he declares, We will get to Ogden, or hell, on time. Now the Irish may have the reputation of not knowing how to say goodbye, but they sure know how to make an entrance. And unfortunately, Cyclone Bill is very sincere in his Faustian bargain. He turns to a reporter and points dramatically. It is 76 miles to Ogden and I will not be happy until I can make it in 72 minutes. Cyclone Bill gets behind the wheel and the train calmly leaves the station, pulling out at a normal speed. Then, once the station is out of sight, Cyclone Bill begins jockeying the train as if it's a racehorse. The machine gains speed, and suddenly, Liz feels the train tilt back like a roller coaster on its way up to the top of the ride. The train corkscrews through gorges and canyons. At times, it leans over a mountain curve with no guardrail, only for Bill to snap it back into place and keep trucking along. Liz catches a glimpse of the outside. From the rear car, the tracks are two lines of fire in the night. The land fled from under us with a horrible nightmare weirdness. The vibrations of the train make her teeth chatter and her cheeks jiggle. Once they start descending, it feels like they're hitting the vertebrae on a spine, clinking down the backbone of the Rockies. Liz looks around and she sees that some of her fellow passengers cannot keep their dinner down. So she plugs her nose and prays. Please let me get to California. I just started this adventure and I'm already gonna die. I'm not even supposed to be here. As everyone else is trying to survive this living hell, Cyclone Bill is thriving. Liz notes that he's cheerfully indifferent to the torture he's inflicting upon his passengers. The officers of the train became alarmed and ordered speed slackened. But Mr. Foley, consulting his watch, regretted with firmness that he could not oblige them. One man writhed in anguish of terror on the floor. And just when she feels like her body can't take it anymore, the train slows and slows, as if it's been going at a reasonable pace the whole time. Liz plucks a few postage stamps out of her hair and looks down to find a reporter in her lap, holding on to her skirt for dear life. But they arrived in Ogden on time. You do need a maniac in order to get an insane job done. Once the train stops, Liz takes a huge inhale. Oh, I cannot believe I'm alive right now. She sits in the stillness and promises to never take it for granted again. Then, Cyclone Bill cheerfully dismounts from his cab and acts like it was a normal train ride. No, hey, hope everyone's okay. He just turns on his heels, exits the train, and Liz watches him walk across the street. He went straight away into a saloon 
with a swinging Venetian door and was lost into the night. But Liz is now in Utah and is closer to her destination than her starting point. She is now the highest up she has ever been in her life. Ogden is 40,000 feet above sea level, walled off with a chain of icy blue mountains that look close enough to touch. She takes the opportunity to stretch her legs. The air here is thin and minty and fresh, crisp like a white wine. She inhales the energizing cold. In Ogden, she transfers onto the Central Pacific Rail Train, also part of the government's race, and travels at a reasonable speed to California. As she settles into her new train, she notices the colors of the Rockies in great detail. Now traveling slower, her jaw drops as she takes in the incredible sights of these folded mountains. She admires what happens when plate tectonics push against one another. At each stop, they pick up more mail and change engines. From here, the vast, desolate uplands show no further signs of human inhabitation and are ormented only with the frequent jackrabbit, the occasional coyote, and now and then an arrangement of teepees. At some stops, Native Americans huddle on the train platform. They stand in a group with their hands reaching up, waiting for a coin to drop into their palms. Liz places a coin in one of the women's hands. The crowd parts. The woman turns around and shows Liz her baby. Strapped onto her back and swaddled in rabbit fur. Liz coos at this tiny, chubby little baby face. Then she thanks the mother and returns to her train. She doesn't know it at the time, but the women that she's just interacted with will be the inspiration for American women's suffrage. The mothers of the suffrage movement gleaned the ideas of women's rights from their own backyards. Many of the early suffragettes had firsthand conversations with Native women about gender dynamics in their tribes. White women learn that Native women are in control of their own property, are part of their democratic process, and had a level of equality in communities that these white women couldn't imagine. Native American philosophies around gender roles are way ahead of the curve and inspire a lot of the suffragettes who were fighting for white women's rights in America. Now, there are a number of Native American tribes with their own language, culture, and traditions, but the chances that the Native American women Elizabeth interacts with have more rights in their communities than Liz has in hers. But she won't feel the impact of these conversations between Native American women and the suffragettes for another 20 years. As Liz pulls away from these women, she settles in for the long ride to Nevada. For miles, nothing but sagebrush and sand poplars blur by. When she arrives in the Silver State, Liz gets out to stretch and inhales the air, fragrant with white clovers. And when it gets dark out, the sky is so clear, not a cloud masks the stars. She is now 2,500 miles away from the East Coast, and Liz stands in awe of how vast the sky is here and looks out into the greater universe. Dad! 
Day six, November nineteenth. After almost five days of speeding across America, the train finally crosses into California. For days, Liz has stared out at the red, dusty landscape, and now enjoys the sight of green, juicy marshes. The air thickens like southern gravy as she hits the edge of America. The lush landscape and warm light invite Liz to the promised land. On November 19th, everyone on Liz's train gets off in Oakland and transfers to a ferry. Liz glides along the San Francisco Bay through the fog. A cluster of brightly colored houses on hills pop through, and she's ahead of time. As was the mail train. At 9:15 on the nose of the ferry boat from Oakland, touches the San Fran wharf. We've crossed the continent in four days and twenty hours, thanks to Mr. Foley. And the distance between New York and the Western metropolis is reduced by a whole day. What a great achievement! She's astounded. It took half a week of her life to get from one side of the country to the other. There are crowds of reporters waiting to interview everyone: the general manager, engineer, conductor, and even me. Liz hopes. This is an auspicious foreshadow of her race. Once she gets onto San Francisco land, Liz is exhausted. But fortunately, she has two days to relax. She arrives in San Francisco early on Tuesday, the nineteenth, but her steamship to Japan is set to leave on Thursday, the twenty-first. Even after JBW. Had bribed and begged the steamship owner to move their schedule up by two days. Liz is fine with this temporary pause. This is the most extensive trip she has ever taken in her adult life. Her body has just gone through so many different temperatures and elevations in a very short amount of time, and she is not used to moving this quickly. Over so much land, she is sore, exhausted, cramped, and couldn't have a real conversation with many strangers because of her gender. Even though her body is paying for it, she's still in awe of what she just went through. Now in California, Liz has been to ten more states. Golly, I have seen so much in these last few days. How vast and diverse our own country is, and I, I did it. And yet, this is just the beginning. San Francisco is a city built on the promise of gold, a land of fog. Huge hills and sea lions. As Liz walks around the financial center of the American West, she notices it has a slower energy than New York, even as it sits on a huge tectonic plate, always threatening an earthquake. So Elizabeth makes her way through the narrow streets and the steep hills to the Palace Hotel. After this five-day adventure, she deserves nothing less. And at the time, it's the largest hotel in the country, filled with newfangled elevators that pull people up and down with the push of a button. There is some space to investigate this first one of many great cities I must pass through. So she settles into her room and prepares to explore. Yet privacy is the last thing she gets. The news of her arrival traveled fast, 
And the reporters in San Francisco are curious to talk to this beautiful East Coast writer making her way around the world. As she tells one reporter, At all stages of the journey, I shall take the fastest surface that I can possibly get. I am enjoying excellent health and believe the trip will not provide such a hardship as some might suppose. I say that I think I could complete the journey in 72 days, provided, of course, no unforeseen accident arises to prevent me from fulfilling the mission. It's a rather novel undertaking, but I feel equal to the occasion. Everything must go with the journey. She's singing a different tune here. One of the female reporters Elizabeth talks to is the well-known expose female journalist Winifred Black. Winifred and Liz's conversation is published on the front page of the Examiner the next day. And everyone who purchases a paper that day wants a look at Liz's face. They know where she's staying and when she's leaving. So because of this article, Liz gets an onslaught of random inquiries over the next two days. A whole army of martyrs so curiously has affected me solely in the two days on the Pacific coast, sending up their cards to the hotel with urgent messages and an admission confessing with placid imprudence that their sole excuse for this intrusion was a desire to look at me. Although the reporters in San Francisco did publicize her arrival, they also offered her a means of protection from the public. The editors of the San Francisco Examiner, who have shown me every courtesy from the moment of my arrival, invited me to luncheon at the Cliff House, which stands on the very western edge of the continent, upon one of the great pillars of the Golden Gate. All she has to do now is be escorted around town and see the sights. This is the kind of travel she wants. The buildings here aren't as tall as they are in New York, but Liz is charmed by the lushness of the city, the fresh seaside air, and the constant drizzle. While walking around these delightful streets, she sniffs a wet rose popping over someone's garden fence. The tip of her nose gets wet as she inhales the sweet perfume, and the scent brings her back home, a place that felt unbelievably far. California is its own large patch on the American quilt. She notices how the sun hits the earth at a different angle here. Liz glows as she explores the Golden State. Day 7, November 20th. On her second day in San Francisco, she does everything she's supposed to do. She takes a cable car and sings with the sea lions. And that night, she connects with an off-duty detective who offers to take her around for the evening. When the sun goes down, a silence sweeps over the city and dissipates like the fog over the harbor. Liz and the detective make their way to the only part of town making noise. Signs hang vertically off of buildings, red lanterns bob around in the wind, boxes of chrysanthemums dangle from balconies. Chinatown is still wide awake. Liz is astonished by how lively the town is, It's nearly midnight, but the town is just as busy as it is at noon. At the time, San Francisco has the largest Asian population in America. Liz and her detective squeeze through the tight streets, lined with joss sticks, 
tucked away in pottery bowls of sand. Their flavory scent is there for offerings and protection. The Chinese need this in the brave new world they are trying to make a life in. The detective brings Liz into the elegant flower house of the Don Kwai Yuan Theater. Everyone in the community gathers to watch classic Chinese dramas late into the morning. They enter the theater, and Liz and the detective weave through the crowds of families and try to get as close to the stage as possible. We go through the left door and sit on the stage as if it was the times of Queen Bess, and this was one of Mr. William Shakespeare's new plays. The audience is basically on top of the actors. The theater is filled to the brim like one of Elizabeth's steam trunks. Liz is jazzed. Theater is exactly what she wants to be doing. Incense perfume the air as the actors take the stage. Liz is so close, she gets to see every stitch and golden needlework in their costumes. As the play goes on, she doesn't really understand the dialogue, but she sits in awe of the human experience, watching their heavily made faces express emotions we all feel. An hour or so goes by, and Liz loves watching the play, but she has a sensitive nose, and the smells of the incense become too overwhelming. So she and the detective exit the tightly packed theater. As they make their way back to the hotel, Liz turns her head and notices a window on the street that is still glowing and active with people inside, exchanging cards and chips. They're playing Fantan, an illegal gambling game. Now I wonder what pushes someone to leave their homeland. Especially because the Chinese in America face extreme discrimination. Despite the fact that their knowledge and engineering expertise helped put together the American railroad system quickly and under budget. It is one of the greatest engineering achievements of the time. But now that the railroads are built, the American government thanks them with the Chinese Exclusion Act. As Liz exits Chinatown, I wonder, what will mainland China be like? Day eight, November 21st. Miss Bislin will leave San Francisco for Yokohama on November 21st and expect to reach New York City in 75 days. Which will win Miss Bislin or Nellie Bly in a race around the world? Now, a few days of stability gave Liz some time to wrap her head around this whole trip. She receives telegrams informing her about the next steps and which tickets to secure. She irons out her itinerary and double-checks the stops. If all goes to plan, she'll be back in her bed in 72 days. In the morning, she gets ready to leave America. She thinks, I love that moment when the hero in a story says adieu to his friends and family. Tears well up with sadness and excitement as they are about to go venture off to new times and new adventures. And here I am. I'm the hero now. But this grand adieu she hoped for is not what she got, because everyone in San Francisco wants a piece of her before she leaves. When she arrives at her boat, it truly feels like the whole city is there to see her off. 
Many of the pleasant acquaintances I had made in my short visit to San Francisco had come to wish me Godspeed, accompanied by a delegation who had gotten wind of my eccentric performance and came with no other credentials than a desire to gape. This was not a figure in my original picture, presumably a sort of an expensive freak show. In all of the hustle and bustle, and people jostling around Liz, somehow a stranger is able to hand her a bouquet of flowers. A mysterious man passes her chrysanthemums and roses. Liz scans the note, signed Mr. Pranther from New Orleans. Liz looks up quickly and catches a glimpse. A hat was lifted from a handsome gray head and two calm, dark southern eyes gave me a smile of such friendliness and goodwill that it warms my heart as if from my own people. People are rooting for her. Now that's a new feeling. Liz appreciates that someone came to see her off who knows how far she's really come from New Orleans. Now that city feels like centuries away after the week she just had. Liz looks up at the massive steamship. When she leaves America, there is no going back. She turns around, sees the sea lions barking, and inhales the sweet California air. Traveling across America is one thing, but... Can I really go around the world alone? She takes a breath, turns around, and steps onto the gangplank. She makes her way onto the boat, and Liz feels something that she hasn't felt before. A tingle of excitement. Liz goes out onto the deck, and watches the last wooden link release itself from stable land. At 3 p.m. on November 21st, the oceanic steamship unlatches itself from America and heads to Japan. As they sail away, Liz watches a flutter of tiny white paper flying under the deck beneath her. Chinese passengers cast prayers overboard to ensure a safe voyage. Liz looks down with the wind in her hair, the smell of the sea on the tip of her nose. She stares out at the hundreds of prayers being received by the ocean. Feeling the swell of the water and her bittersweet goodbyes, she chokes on her excitement and sadness of leaving America. Liz is going to Asia and as far as the world will let her. This show was researched, written, produced, narrated, scripted, edited, edited again, soundscaped, rescripted, scored, voiced, and mixed and mastered by me, Adrian Bain. Sam Dingman was our editorial consultant and emotional support. Elizabeth Bisland was played by Adrian Bain. Newspaper Man Number One and reporter Brock Grizzle was played by Jonathan Tenace. Newspaper Man Number Two, Reporter Chick Hannaford, and Cyclone Bill were played by Sam Dingman. Newspaper Man Number Three was played by Terrence Dalton. John Brisbane Walker and Newspaper Man Number Four was played by Nick Markovitz, and Father Time was played by Jake Dingman. Resources that helped bring the show alive are 80 Days by Matthew Goodman, In Seven Stages, A Flying Trip Around the World, and for more resources, go to our website, strangersabroadpodcast.com. Please go to Apple Podcasts to rate, review, and subscribe to A Race Around the World. If you leave a review, I will read it at the end of the credits, 
Listener MTS Hart gave five stars, said it's a delight, an unbelievable story, and an absolute delight to listen to. I love this podcast. I can't wait to hear how each episode unfolds. Thank you so much. It will take a long time because going around the world takes a minute, even if you're just writing about it. Fascinating and well-produced by Jessica Festa, who gave it five stars. I always love hearing new stories, and this one is fascinating. The production quality is also very professional, wink. Definitely add the show to your listening list. Oh, thank you, Jessica. But thank you so much, and everyone else, please write and review, and I will read them on the show. And if you're interested in all of the bonus content, anecdotes, and historical facts that didn't get into the show, head over to our TikTok at Strangers Abroad Podcast. You can email us at strangersabroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening and come back next week for another leg in the adventure of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland. Safe travels to everyone out there.